Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I am here today at the Rock Island Auction Company taking a look at some of the guns from their upcoming April of 2016 premiere auction. And this particular one is a Thompson Auto Rifle, an uh, extremely rare gun. This is a US Trials Rifle. Most people are probably familiar with Thompson for his submachine gun, the classic gangster trench broom prototypical American 45 caliber submachine gun. However, General John Thompson and his company Auto Ordnance also participated in the attempt of the search of the US military to develop a self-loading rifle. In fact, he was one of the very first entrants. Um, the development of this rifle began in 1919, and this was a combined effort between Thompson as a financier and a guy named uh, John Blish. He was a commander in the US Navy and an engineer or a engineer sort of person. And he noticed on big naval guns that they would sometimes come partially unscrewed, the, the breech blocks, when firing. And he thought about this and studied it, and he came to the conclusion that there was something called a Blish principle, which was this idea that at very high pressure, the coefficient of friction between two slanted uh, opposing surfaces would actually increase. So when they're under very high pressure, they won't slip against each other. But as pressure drops, the coefficient of friction also drops, and at some point when the pressure is low enough, the two surfaces will slide. Now he took this, this principle and applied it to small arms. And the idea, which turned into the Thompson Auto Rifle, um, started in 1919, like I said, and this was developed for about 10 years. The idea was if we have basically a very coarse screw on the back of the bolt, when the rifle fires, the Blish principle will cause the, the threaded surfaces of this screw to stick together and the bolt will stay closed until pressure drops. And when pressure is low enough and the force on this screw drops enough, then it'll slip and unscrew and unlock the bolt and cycle. This sounds really good. Unfortunately, it's not real. There is no Blish principle. The coefficient of friction on two metal surfaces is constant, uh, no matter what the pressure on them is. So. The, the, this rifle in actual practical reality was simply a delayed blowback. The force required to turn this screw in the bolt did delay the opening of the rifle and the, the strength of the recoil spring would help to some extent. Uh, and this rifle functioned, but it always just kind of barely functioned. We know that, for example, the Pedersen self-loading rifle, which was also a delayed blowback, we knew that that system extracted under very high pressure and required this wax lubrication on the cartridges in order to work reliably. Well, the Thompson was the same way. The Thompson rifle required a pair of oiled pads on each side of the magazine well to give the cartridge cases a light coat of oil uh, before they were fed so that they'd have some lubricant that would allow them to be uh, reliably extracted under very high pressure, which is how this rifle operated. Now, this, the first version of this rifle was in the 1919 tests, or 1920 tests, very early um, in the US work on a self-loading rifle. And uh, into, through the mid-1920s, Thompson was competing against actually the primer activated uh, Garand rifle, as well as several other competitors. And the whole time, while, for example, Garand's rifle design changed substantially through the course of development, the Thompson rifle didn't really change all that much. Um, the whole time it had this screw thread bolt mechanism uh, and there were a couple of downsides to this mechanism. One of them is that it led to a very long receiver. Um, the receiver on this model I believe is like 13 and a half inches long which leads to a very long gun. This was 50 and a, and a fraction of an inch long and that leads to a very heavy gun. The Thompson rifles all fluctuated at between 10 and a half or 10 and three quarter and up to 11 pounds or even a little bit more. And that was substantially over the Army ideal of eight and three quarter pounds. So these were bulky rifles, they were long, they were heavy. Throughout the testing, they were kind of always complaining that the shooter's face was too close to the receiver because the receiver was very long. And despite all this, the rifle actually survived in testing and trials for about 10 years. Now this particular model is a 1923 pattern gun, which was developed in response to several of the earlier trial outcomes. And it was finally tested by the U.S. Ordnance Department in 1925. And it was tested against a uh, primer actuated Garand and a Pedersen rifle and a couple others. 
and it was actually determined to be good enough that they ordered 20 of them made to be sent out to infantry and cavalry units for field testing. Now at that time they did note several problems with the gun, namely it ejected at high pressure, uh, they felt the gun and the receiver were both too long and too heavy, and it, it was somewhat prone to malfunctions. They didn't, they didn't really like it as much as some of the other guns, but it wasn't bad enough to be thrown out of the trials. So, 20 were made, and this one is serial number 12. It's one of those 20 test rifles. Those rifles were finally, they didn't get tested for a little while. It was 1926 and 1927 when the infantry and the cavalry boards both reported on their work with this rifle as well as the Garand rifle and the Pedersen rifle. And they both found this to be the weakest of the, the contestants in this search for a self-loading rifle. Um, with basically the same problems. Uh, in particular, they really didn't like the fact that it required oiled cartridges. That was, that really is a substantial flaw to the rifle. It means an oiled cartridge is much more likely to pick up dirt. If you run out of oil, all of a sudden your rifle no longer works. Now it did work reliably as in this model as long as it was, the cartridges were properly oiled. Although it's interesting that the infantry board uh, reported that the oiling actually caused them some accuracy issues. Namely, when the gun was cleaned, and so the chamber was clear of, basically clear of oil, um, and then they started shooting, the first cartridge, the first round fired, would often hit low compared to all the rest. So that accumulation of oil in the chamber changed the point of impact of the rifle. And that's, while that may not be a catastrophic thing, that really wasn't a good thing. And that was just another problem with having this requirement for oiled cartridges. So by 1929, the infantry, the semi-automatic rifle board put together by the U.S. Ordnance Department, had that, that, they had, in 1929 they ran a new trial and by that point the Thompson auto rifle was no longer an entrant. Uh, af after these, the, the 26 and 27 field testing and an Ordnance Department report in 28, uh, Thompson gave up and stopped working on this. At that point, the Thompson submachine gun was doing much better. It's interesting to note that the Thompson submachine gun was also originally developed on this Blish principle. However, it was a 45 caliber gun and it was perfectly safe and functional as a simple blowback, which is what it truly was. Simple blowback in a 30 6 which is what the Thompson was chambered for, that's kind of a whole different ball of wax and that was problematic. So why don't we go ahead and take a closer look at this and I can show you the, the screw thread in the bolt that was supposed to delay it and the oil pads and all that. All right, so let's start with the markings here. We've actually got this really cool, big lengthy marking on top of the receiver, very similar to kind of what you would see on a Thompson submachine gun. So we've got that famous bullet logo with Thompson's signature in it on the very top. And then this is marked a Thompson auto rifle, caliber 30, model 1923, and this is serial number 12. Again, it was the model of 1923 that was tested by the military in 1925. Now, this was manufactured by the Colt's Patent Firearms Manufacturing Company in Hartford, Connecticut for Auto Ordnance of New York. Colt was the company manufacturing Thompson submachine guns, so it just naturally makes sense that they would have gone to Colt for the, this rifle production as well. All right, there is one other thing, and that is on this component in here, it is marked firing position, which I don't entirely understand because this doesn't rotate into any other position, it just moves back and forth. So I don't, I'm not entirely sure what they mean by firing position or what information they're trying to convey. At any rate, we have a bolt handle here, and you can see that there is a change in material right there. We've got two different parts. So the bolt head is located right here in the receiver, and it's got several rows of coarse threading, and by pulling the bolt handle, I can manually unscrew the bolt and then pull it rearward. Now, right inside there, you can see six rows of uh, threads. So this is, remember, this is actually locked at the back of uh, the bolt. So the chamber is up here, and the chamber face is right at the front of the magazine. There's no space for a locking lug there. Instead, our locking threads are here in the back end of the, the bolt and receiver. Now there is a manual hold open, kind of like a submachine gun catch. At the back of the receiver, I can pull the bolt handle all the way back and lock it into this catch. That, that locks the bolt fully open 
which allows you to do things like take the bottom of the magazine off and replace the oiled pads, for example. Um, this may also have something to do with disassembly. Honestly, I'm not sure how to disassemble this rifle. There aren't any manuals out there. It's interesting to note that the receiver appears to be made in two pieces, and you can see that it's threaded together right here. We have a, you can see the threads down here. It looks like, and maybe you just have to take the stock off to do this, but it looks like the two halves of the receiver unscrew apart. And there's, I suspect these are also uh, markings relating to disassembly. So we're not going to get into those today, unfortunately, but there they are. Um, oh, I should have noted uh, the patent dates, the various uh, applicable patents are all here on the side of the receiver. And it's kind of interesting to note that there's this thumb cutout for using a stripper clip that was clearly added after the rifle was made because when they cut that notch, you can just barely see the beginning of some sort of May or maybe March patent date right up on top. And they just ground that patent date off to, to make a, a thumb spot for loading. This had a five round magazine, pretty standard magazine, used stripper clips right back here. Uh, some of the variations of the Thompson rifle actually used a cardboard charger clip, very much like a Swiss K31 clip. I believe this one had gone to standard stripper clips. Now, one neat feature, we've got this thing on the side of the rifle. Well, that can be removed. If I lift up at the back here and then slide this whole thing forward, this comes off. This is a cover plate for our ejector. So the ejector is removable, easily replaceable, never a bad idea on a military rifle to have parts like this that are under a lot of stress. You know, it's, this thing's getting slammed into by a cartridge case every time you fire, so it definitely has the potential to break. So making that an easily field serviceable part is not a bad idea. So we can then put this cover plate back on, snap it into place. The rear sight on this rifle appears to be basically a commercial, kind of a Lyman looking adjustable peep sight. Uh, why not, you know? Uh, this gave a nice aperture at the very back of the receiver, so this thing has a very long sight radius. It would probably be a reasonably accurate rifle, um, not accounting for any potential accuracy problems resulting from the uh, chamber being oiled. The floor plate here is held in place with this little disassembly pin. Uh, I don't have the official Thompson gun disassembly tool, but I do have my universal gun disassembly tool. So we'll push that in and then slide this plate backwards. And then it comes off. This is, you know, pretty typical of bolt action rifles. Got our follower, our magazine spring, and our floor plate. Then the cool part is we can now see inside the magazine well, and you can see these two black felt oiled pads. Uh, they're pretty hardened up now. You know, they've been in there a long, long time. But you've got two of those pads on either side of the receiver. And you can see here, the way they're made appears to be a piece of either brass or steel with a felt pad on either side. So if one dried out, you could pull it out, flip it over, and put it back in and continue using it. Exactly what the, the lifespan, so to speak, of these was, I don't know. You know how many, once you oil them up, how many rounds can you fire before you have to attend to them again? That I'm not sure. I haven't found a detailed enough trials report that includes that information. There is this on here. This looks like a sling swivel, but I'm not sure why they would have a sling swivel that close to the receiver. Uh, not sure what was taken off there, but something at some point. There's one interesting anecdote with this rifle that the ejection was so violent, well first off it always produced smoke out the breech because you still had a lot of gas in the chamber when, it, when cases were ejected. And that was something that the Ordnance Department officials at TESS always noted was the somewhat frightening amount of smoke coming out the breech. And they also discovered that if you, you could put like some pine, wooden pine boards fairly close to the rifle in its ejection path and the ejection was forceful enough that when cases hit those wood boards mouth first, they would often actually stick in the wooden board, and that's a little frightening. Uh, when you get right down to it in a military context, that can actually be dangerous. If you've got a bunch of soldiers clustered together shooting, you really don't want the ejecting cases to be capable of injuring, like literally injuring other troops. 
Well, thank you for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, very few of these sorts of trials rifles still survive today. You know, the thing's nearly 100 years old, and there were only 20 of them made in the very first place. If you'd like to own this one, uh, certainly a really cool addition to any military rifle collection or anyone who's interested in Thompson guns, uh, it is, of course, coming up for sale. This is an auction house after all here. So if you take a look at the description text below, you'll find a link to the Rock Island Auction Company catalog page on this rifle. You can take a look at their pictures and their description and uh, come up here to Rock Island to participate in the auction or place a bid online. Thanks for watching.